Why did Buffett buy the airlines in 2016? Because he saw a consolidation. Uh, yes, same, he's, yeah. because once it becomes a... Uh, once it becomes a... Uh, what's oligopoly, oligopoly yeah. right? Then you can cartel your way through. You mm. can all cooperate to raise prices together. That's what you're seeing in shipping right now. Uh, let me digress a little bit. Yeah. In shipping right now, uh, 80, 85% of the global freight is shipping freight is controlled by 10 companies. Right now, you know that shipping freight is coming down, right? Because after a blockbuster year last year. So now they are restrict artificially restricting supply. Okay, I'm not trying to justify it. <laughs> I'm just saying that's what they do. It la. is what it is. That's yes, what yes. Do. So it's the same story as what Buffett saw in 2016 for the big four US carriers before COVID. Uh, right now you have three. I, I thought this would take about 15 years to happen. 10 to 15 years while the ASEAN growth story uh, takes shape now, you know. We are going to become next China, right? So it seems like it's already here for 17x. Okay? Uh, Asia has economies of scale. They can bully their way through just through sheer willpower. And I'm not saying they're going to take down Laya and Beard yet. They don't need to. They can share the pie. Yeah. We're talking about the whole of ASEAN. The whole pie is going anyway. Yes, just to give you some color. Before we begin the podcast, have you gotten your free ebook? It's called the Build a Six Figure Portfolio Guidebook. Now, inside it, we share with you the tips and tricks to bring your stock investing skills to the next level. The best part, it's only 10 pages long and it's totally free. Whether you're on Spotify or YouTube, the link to download is in the description or you can go to www.firl.co slash F-R-E-E or www.firl.co slash free. Hey guys, welcome back to the FIRO podcast, best place for long-term stock investors. Um, you know, today we have uh, yet another recurring guest. Now, some people might see this as us being lazy. Uh, maybe that's true. But uh, we choose to see it as uh, that, you know, we are bringing back good quality guests. Right? And at the end of the day, it's uh, what people, what you guys want to listen to. So even if we introduce a new guest all the time, if it's bad, right, then, you know, we are not, at least I feel I'm not doing my job. So yeah, um, today we have uh, with us back again, Mr. Aaron Peck. And uh, he actually, uh, first one, which you can check it out here, we'll probably put a card there uh, on YouTube. But you can uh, go and check out the first interview. He shared his life story, how he views uh, investing and some names that he talked about as well. And uh, welcome back to the pod. Yeah, hi, nice to meet you again yeah physically this time right because uh the yeah. last time was on zoom right? on zoom. so i mean uh, everyone can hear your life story uh in your very first podcast so we're gonna go straight into like some of the interesting topics uh you're a man of many interests uh let's start with one that you share a lot about very often in the group chats that we are part of right and that is um the macro situation sure, sure. so i cannot talk about macro today in today's context without using the word inflation. Okay. So what are your what are your thoughts and are there certain narratives around inflation today that you feel that doesn't right quite hit the target? Okay. Mm, well, like everything macro needs context. Mm -hmm, <laughs> so mm -hmm. the thing about the macro in today's context is that uh, a lot of things have happened for pretty much the first time in history. So there's not okay. much of a precedent. You even consider the 70s some form of precedent? There is, but it's not uh, It's not the same. Okay. It's not parallel even. Right? It's just, okay, it is parallel. Okay. It, enough of the metaphors, right? But yeah. anyway, uh, there are a lot of things which are unique and therefore we can't just say, oh, you should have done this. I see. Right, that kind of thing. Uh, just give an example. I mean, obviously a pandemic is, is one. Then uh, they shut everything down. Right, and then they flooded the world with money. The central banks. This is the 2020 steamy packages, uh, right? Uh, even I would argue to just before the Ukraine war, like, mm, mm, right? Mm. And uh, so everyone had money, right? And then they went out to buy goods because they were locked at home, right? Not services. And uh, the goods came from predominantly China, manufactured, yeah, imported, right, to the US. Let's just use US and China. So um, 
this then contributed to okay so sorry so that contributed to supply chains backlogging right mm-hmm. and then you had your ships having issues you have your uh what is it freight rates going up things like that yeah freight rates going up right uh supply chains uh, your ports all these kind of things uh. then uh soon after that the economy roared back to life <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. Right, so if you, you remember the stock price chart of uh, April 2020, it went like that. Yeah, it, it popped back up, and it went all the way <laughs> beyond the the Correct. pre-COVID peak. Right. Uh, typically that takes one two years. Maybe this will happen within the same year. I think a part of that is the stimi- stimulus as well. Right. It is a stimulus. It is a stimulus. Right. So uh, the stimulus is actually something that has never happened before, which is what we call helicopter money. Helicopter money is a taboo in the traditional uh, e- economics world because you are not supposed to tamper with nature, right? Just like yeah. you see a, a the free market, the invisible hand. Correct, correct. That. Yes. So, um, as a result, uh, they, they 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 effectively printed money. So what the central bank did was their mandate doesn't allow them to just deliver checks straight to the dollar, you know. So what they actually did was that they set up a SPV with the treasury. Right. And then they pump money in, and it is the treasury who is the one that's distributing money. It's all technical, but yeah. effectively, it's printing money and giving people uh, right, right, delivering it straight to your to your to your door, you know. So um, so. And then when the economy came back, people came back to work, and then they realized that they had the power to choose now. So now there was a labor supply chain issue. Mm. Because people were jumping, people didn't want to. Uh, they wanted to work from home. They didn't want to. They they wanted to choose, right? So you see wages going up. Yeah. And that's a problem because after shelter, wages is the stickiest form of inflation. After shelter, wages. Yeah. Right. Because nobody wants to be have their salaries cut. Is no, no. Right? Uh, 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 yes, partly true, but also because normally in a let's say your goods go up in price. Yeah. Uh. There are ways to make it go back down, right? Like remove the sub, increase the supply. It it, top, it typically works itself, right? Like mm. if let's say this this mic was selling for a thousand bucks, right? I don't know the price. Uh, two thousand. Yeah. Two thousand. Okay, let's say it's selling for ten thousand. You would start to buy it and then sell, so increase supply, and then price automatically fix itself. Wages has a human component to it. Correct. So again, right? It's like the cutting of jobs, stuff like that, right? And uh, uh. It's sticky lah, basically, right? Right. Same as home ownership. Uh. So um wages was the primary contributor to the 70s uh stagflation. Really? Through Not the commodities. Uni- uh commodities was uh the the okay, commodities was the catalyst. Mm, mm. Wages was the underlying problem for the over the few decades. Right. That they were kicking kicking a hand down the road. And I remember correctly there was that whole debate about the Phillips curve at that point in time, right? This uh-huh, was the whole uh-huh. yes, right, yes. right, right. Uh you wanna go into it? No, 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 no. no, no continue <laughs> your trip talk. I, I just Okay, my, my, my point is this a lot of things happened for the first time. Right. And I recall if you recall, I think a few months ago, uh Jack uh Fat Power. Mm-hmm. Power actually says uh we are starting to understand how little we really understand about inflation. Right? You remember he said a quote? No, but you can go and it's YouTube, great yeah. that he, he does that. Like. I think the Federal Reserve sometimes feel like they can, you know, they're masters of the universe, but really they're not. Yeah, yeah no. Uh, my point is to say that, uh, okay, I, I'll boil it down to layman's terms. What it means is that our inflation theories, our models are still mm. inadequate. Right. We have not really figured it out yet, which is why it's still such an art. So what's the big thing that is new today that say the previous hyperinflationary period, call it the 70s. Uh, h- how, how is it different? You see, in the 70s, the problem was mainly that there was a very pro-labor union. Correct. Because, uh, okay, I, I don't remember how it got to that way off the top of my head, but by the 70s, the labor unions were very strong. Mm-hmm. So when the oil embargo came in, right, what happened is that it caused inflation. And because the labor unions were strong, they were able to bargain for higher wages. Yeah. And higher wages feed into higher demand, Correct. The which feeds back into higher wages. Mm. It just spirals upwards. And there is a, let's say there's a highway. <laughs> right. Right. Whereas after sorry, after the Reagan, uh, uh, he broke the back of the unions, right? As well as Thatcher, uh, in the eighties. So that's when you start seeing wages per percent of GDP just go down like this. Doesn't it never stop? 
Mm. And that was a, a different epoch of uh, economics already. Prior to that, uh, there's a very good article, uh, maybe I can yeah. share it right later, where the guy dis- discusses the, the economic era. Uh, uh, after, th- there was the, the Great Depression, B- pre-depression, pre-29, the Roaring Twenties. Yep. Then after Roaring Twenties, there was a focus by FDR to uh, uh, prioritize wage growth, right? or, or, or people are basically labor la, at the expense of companies. Right, because this was the, the that was the narrative at the time. We help the people, they will help back the economy. Right. Then uh that extended until the late seventies before Reagan came in. When Reagan came in, I think it was nineteen seventy one. Sorry, nineteen eighty one. I forgot already. Yeah. Reagan the, the, is uh seventy nine, I think. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. It was around after the time. Carter, yeah. Yes. No. Yeah, after no. Uh, Carter was during when Paul Walker broke the bank so, of inflation so, in so seventy nine. The math is, I think, seventy, seventy about eighty one. Three about was that. Watergate, so seventy three to yes. seventy seven was yeah yeah something about like uh was uh Gerald Ford, I believe. Then after that is Carter. Yeah, okay. Sorry, continue. All right. So it was the air controller strike of eighty one, mm. as well as Thatcher's miner strike. They both broke it. That was the beginning of the end for the unions. So since then, the bargaining power moved to the corporations. That's how you get sky high CEO salaries versus uh, lowest paid salary. Yeah. Right. And how the stock markets have climbed, and uh, partly not directly related, but partly related how bond bond uh, yields have been deteriorating since then. Never came forty years stretch down, right? So it, it all feeds into it, Right. So now. Oh right, I haven't answered your question. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah, no, no, yeah. So yeah. now we are actually entering a new era, back to the labor era. Okay, uh, you are seeing unions having power again, right? Uh, ESG. Uh, like ESG. I mean yeah, the I guess, mood, the, the, yeah, the yeah. mood. Not maybe the mechanics is very different, but the yeah, mood. yeah, yeah. Correct, correct. But okay, let me go back to your question. How is different this time, right? Yeah. So um, the seventies were characterized by the the oil embargo and the union, the, the inflationary episode. Uh. Today, we don't have the unions yet. They are getting back their power. We are seeing it. But it's still very nascent. So they are not the ones contributing to the actual inflation of the past one year. Right. The main reason is one, overstimulus, right? Helicopter money. So this is exactly what uh, monetarists like Milton Friedman uh, were advising against. And yeah. to be fair, they were right. They were right. advising of a, for a more rules-based kind of uh, monetary correct, system, correct, yes. right? Correct, uh, correct, There's actually a very good video I just watched. Uh, let's go into that later. Yeah, later. yeah, yeah. But uh, that's one. Two, supply chains. Yes. Supply chains was from, call it, I don't know, January. Okay, let's call it whole of 2021. Right? And uh, remember also that the Fed kept the stimulus going. Not, Of course, they didn't know the Ukraine what happened, right? Right. So they kept the stimulus going. Why? Because their priority was the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. It was nope. an uh, immediate issue that they had to solve. Yes. Right? And we are only able to complain about inflation today because the pandemic problem is over. True. Right? Which means that they didn't necessarily do anything wrong per se with, without 2020 hindsight. We are the ones with 20 hindsight and using hindsight analysis. Correct, correct. To, to, to look back and say, hey, you should have done this. When, if we were put in the shoes, we probably would have done a worse job. Yeah. Right? True. And then there was the Ukraine war. So you see, uh, it's three separate instances of inflation, you know. It's not one stretch, you know. This is what, this is cause of our shit bias. Uh. Right? We look back, we say, oh, the Fed should have done this in November 2020. Right, they shouldn't have done this. You should have done that. Right? Yeah, why didn't you tell them that? Right. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, that's true. <laughs> la. But at the same time, you are forgetting there are actually three different causes to the inflation. The Ukraine war, especially, is not something you can blame them for. Yeah. They are just managing it, and yet people are blaming them for the inflation caused by the Ukraine war. And, and, and I'm not here to defend them. I'm just saying that it's objectively not their fault la, to not foresee this, la, you know. So um the Ukraine war is also a new thing in the context of inflation today, right? It's caused by supply chains, yes, but more on a geopolitical uh, okay. uh, angle. So, I mean, 
then the question is, uh, the way, I mean, at least the popular theory goes that in the 70s, the inflation was solved with Paul Walker ramping up interest rates. And of, of course, like that's what people say, but when you look deep also, he, he actually, in his general raising of the interest rates, he preceded the 81, 82 recession, I think, and he actually lowered interest rates temporarily in those eras, but very sustainably, and then start increasing them back again. So that was, that's generally how people explain, you know, the US getting out of hyperinflation and all that. But how about today? Because in the 80s, right, you can imagine it was still a very US dominated world. So uh, it's still a somewhat US dominated world, but today we've got a lot of other countries that are going to be as massive or close to the US in size, sure, right? Sure. So how do we even get out of something like that? And more importantly, as an investor, right? What's likely to happen? In terms of fixing inflation, mm. right? What should we do? What should policymakers do? A, and B, as an investor, because we never know what the policymakers will do. Sure, sure, sure. What is likely to happen? Okay. Well, uh, that's a very, very big question. <laughs> okay. First of all, right? Um, there are some... And I'm sure this was also true in the in the seventies. It's just that we are only looking at the surface. Of course. Today we have the privilege of looking into the deep waters, right? So we can see some things which are weird, okay, which does not really jive with our understanding of economics. For right. instance, GNI and GDP, mm. they are they they they, they are they are almost one one normally, and today they are like this. Mm. There's no real. Uh, I haven't, there was a guy writing an article about it. I haven't read it yet. Okay, okay. <laughs> Maybe you can link it later. So, um, that's one. Uh, also, okay, you on the one hand, you have, uh, you have, sorry, what was your idea? On the one hand, you have stores closing down. On the other hand, you have uh, vacancies. Hold on. Uh. It's supposed to be opposite. Let me think about it. It's one hand is vacancies for uh, labor. Right. What's the opposite of vacancies? Uh, the spots are filled up. I don't know. No, no your, your wages are coming down, is it? Yeah. If there's vacancies, your wages should go up, right? You meaning that if... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, I can't remember, but basically, uh, businesses are not doing well. But at the same time, we have employment vacancies. Mm. Right, so that's a bit weird, also, right? Uh, normally, if it's a recession, there shouldn't be a lot of vacancies, right? Now there's still a lot of vacancies, a lot of wage growth, or, or a bit of wage growth. Okay, right. Um, then there is things like so. This is part of the reason why Fed, what the the power is saying, uh, we have room for a soft landing, because wage growth, right? Um, but yeah, but, but I mean, going back to my question, right? Like, okay, is, sorry, sorry, is it? Like, is it likely to taper, to slow down uh, inflation? Or it's going to be something like, no, inflation is still going to be higher than like the 2% target, but yeah. it's not going to be as intense as the recent pass of like 8-9%. Um, I have to think about it. Okay, there are many factors contributing to US inflation. Mm -hmm. One is the recession in China. Ah, yes, right? let's talk about China, yes. Uh, you want to talk about China now? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, since you, since you brought no, no, it up. No, no. Okay. Right. Uh, just to answer your, your earlier question. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So, China is 20% of GDP. Global it will, GDP. if it goes to a recession, it will have an impact on US deflation. Right? And then you also have uh, the Fed hiking rates. So, the one thing that's worse than a recession is hyperinflation. Mm. So, that's their current enemy that they're they are, they are betting against. Right? And um, um, that rate hike you know, they've been hacking rates by quite a lot recently, could contribute to deflation. Okay, uh, and, and there are many reasons which we can go into, but my final answer <laughs> is both sides are possible. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yes, based on current inflation uh, theory, right? What we understand based on uh, precedent, uh, both sides are still possible. We can actually come out of it. We can have a mild recession. We can have a big recession, which is hard landing. Mild is soft landing. And we can, yeah. The answer is I don't know. Okay. Yeah. No. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> right. Like. I mean. <laughs> but it's great that uh, even though you, you know I could see that it's a challenge to put your answer. I think that that itself is the message, right? That um, yes. I, I, you know that, that there's a there's a there's a joke, right? Like 
economists always say on the other hand, right? There are many okay. hands, right? So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, true. Right. that's true. Um, yeah. yeah. So China, like, so I think right now, you know, we're in the content creation space, so we know a lot of fellow creators are taking advantage of uh, this whole like bank run situation that might be happening in China, and they're creating videos, getting good views out of it. Maybe we should do it as well. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but. Yeah, I think my views, a lot of people are predicting like a hard landing because of their experiences in the US, right? Where there's a bank run and then everything transpired. But I do think that China will look more like a Japan in terms okay. of a managed source, kind of like death by a thousand cuts kind of situation. Yeah. Um, but what are your thoughts? Like the the whole China situation with what we're going on, we, we can never use parallels to Japan because at the end of the day, Japan is a very big island. China is... Um, the land mass population is very different sure, sure, but sure. they do have similar sort of cultural and you know almost an obsessive um, devotion to stability yeah sure. so what what are your thoughts on the uh, the China situation okay uh, I'm going to have to oversimplify some stuff okay For sure. so um, on the economic front the parallel I draw here is the Great Financial Crisis in the US, two thousand eight. Oh, okay. Right, which is basically a, a financial crisis, a, a bank crisis, as well as a, um, the large percentage of GDP sector crisis in China today is property. Right, right. China is something like twenty five percent of the GDP growth, something like that. Mm, right, mm. and then the wealth, I think, like seventy five percent of people. Yes, yes, that's wealth true. is tied Correct. to. Yeah. Um. So that's where we will use as a starting point. The subsequent thing I think about is that China has a uh, has a uh, is the government is a uh, okay. Let's just use the word is an authoritarian regime, right? Which means that they have control. That's something they're very good at. The differences between China today and the GFC is that they have control, right? <laughs> One. Uh, so what are the advantages of this? One, they have capital controls. Mm -hmm. So you don't have money fleeing the the country. Yeah. The domestic side. Which means that the forex of the yuan is relatively much more stable. Right? And also they uh you know the PBOC they, they are export exporting nation, mainly export nation. Most of the GDP is exports. So when you export, what you do is that you okay, think of your currency like butter, my USD for your yuan. Mm. Right? That's the the underlying butter we make before we actually butter our goods. So I'm actually giving you USD, right? In exchange for your goods, yeah, right? So you can take a USD and then sell it to buy yuan. And because you have this inflow of USD, uh, it's, we, we call it a surplus, uh, a current surplus. You actually can uh, offset any outflows of uh, yuan Especially since the only ones who are outflowing are the foreigners. The domestic guys are locked in. Even so the foreigners are finding a hard time to get money out, right? Uh, at least they are legally allowed yeah, to. Yeah, them, yeah. Right? But the foreigners tend to be a much smaller proportion compared to say, I don't know, uh, Malaysia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? yeah, yeah. Right? The moment there is hoo-ha, right? even the Malaysians will, 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 will exit into USD or something, correct? So, um, <coughs> that, that stems the tide of outflows of yuan, right? So uh, again, it's about control, and also um, political control. They have the ability to withstand pain, right? Even the people uh, I don't know complain, the political apparatus can remain intact. Okay, so um, these are the pros of having a, a authoritarian regime. And uh, one thing that you can draw a parallel to what they are doing now is a very textbook Keynesian recovery. Because if you think about, for those of you who don't know, in Keynesian economics, how it's supposed to happen, okay, is that uh, during, the, during the bad times, we stimulus, compared to a uh, uh, Austrian approach, which is we, we, we let nature run its yeah, course, yeah, yeah. right? So we, we stimulate- like four people in the tax department, something like that, that's the dream, the dream Austrian. Uh. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a Keynesian economics where during a recession, we stimulate, because the government has the wherewithal to stimulate, right? right? Then when, so what we do is we, okay, th then, then when we, uh, when the economy is recovering, we uh, recover the sub true surpluses, 
tax surpluses, right? Mm-hmm. So then we pay back the debt of the last generation so that the next recession, last recession, sorry, so the next recession we can stimulate again, right? So it's a self-correcting uh, yeah. uh, kind of thing. And uh. you need to have that apparatus, like you said, that uh, can get things done. Uh. Your, the intentions can become actions. Uh. Yeah, we'll get into that, okay? Mm-hmm. So, um, Australia is also an example of something that has done this very well. I see. Right, okay? Practice Keynesian economics properly. The problem with uh, uh, most democracies is that you have a four-year election cycle. Yeah, correct, correct. So what happens is that during the bad times, obviously you stimulate, right? But during the good times, you don't pay it back. You stimulate more. Mm. Trump, 2017, tax cuts. <laughs> during a hottest economy ever, right? Because of overstimulus, right? So there was actually stimulus before the current <laughs> situation. Correct, correct. So... Um, what you end up happening is that you don't get uh, like a wave length kind of waveform kind of uh, Keynesian pattern. You get what we call a long term debt cycle, right? Which is that it goes down, uh, the, 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 the debt increase, it gets recovered a little bit, and then it goes higher to the next peak. So eventually you get to a point where even that cannot be sustainable, which is where we are. The, long, the end of a long term debt, debt cycle. And then it just, because you cannot stimulate enough, right? You got to pay back all the sins of your old generations, right? It collapses. Ah. So that was nineteen twenty nine. Today we are there also. <laughs> okay. For the US. Ah. Uh, no, no, just US, everywhere, including everywhere. China. Including China. Including yeah, China. so actually, I, I don't know whether you've, you've looked into the China debt situation because yes. I a few years ago, I was quite shocked to find out that actually the US and China total debt to GDP is almost neck and neck. Yes. In fact, China... Uh, I was just reading so- somewhere that they used to every, for every debt that they incur, they used to one dollar of debt to incur. They use they generate one dollar GDP. I think now the number is something like three and four dollars of debt for one dollar GDP, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any sense of the debt situation? Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. Okay, do you want me to finish the last question? Oh yes, yes, yes. <laughs> okay, I'll yeah. just wrap it up. Currently, what uh. China's uh, government is doing is very textbook Keynesian, which is that uh, first they pick the bubble, right? So they did a three red line thing. They pop the property bubble by themselves, which is what you're supposed to do. Right? Right. You don't let it run its course and then pop by itself chaotically, which is yeah. GFC. La. So it was a managed uh, correction. And then you are supposed to enable a smooth deleveraging which means that the economy goes down like this, like a plane touching down, you know, it doesn't go boom. You know. Soft landing. Uh, yeah. Soft landing, correct. So you can see that doing them doing that as well, which is that they are, you know, they, are, they recently uh, lowered the interest rates, right? The policy rate. And also they are, every time that it seems to have a problem, they step in, then they'll take off the gas to let it leverage further. Then they step in. So you are, you, are, you are like putting a floor beneath how much you can yep. fall, right? Yep. Rather than you fall all the way down. Then, uh, also, they are. Um, what was the other thing? Oh, you look at a credit impulse. Credit impulse is your incremental debt to GDP. Okay, which means how much debt to GDP you add in that particular period. It's not going up, right? Mm. Which implies they are intention is or it is deleveraging, because if it was stimulus, then it would be going up, right? And in our economy, for reasons that's too long to explain right now, banking, I see. Um, uh, it's a credit-based economy. It's not really a monetary-based economy. Right. So not seeing cre- so so your 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 cycles move with credit cycles, and not seeing a debt increase is a very good sign, right? As opposed to the doom and gloom, which is that they are forced to stimulate. So then you will see credit go up, right? So it's moving. Everything is moving in the right direction. So of course the problem is small people like us. We will see it as a huge tragedy la, you know like the whole world is ending la. because the scale is so large ma. the whole of China is going downwards instead of upwards ma, right yeah it's like seeing the Titanic sinking eh, you know but uh, if you understand Keynesian economics there is room to make that case that they are doing it and they're doing it pretty well la. yeah because keep in mind during a democracy when this happens what happens there's mobs there's protests there's uprisings you know your, your Sri Lankas blah 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 they overthrow uh, for better or worse, China is an authoritarian regime. They can keep these political situations stabilized. And um, you can run your course. 
the deleveraging necessary, right? Which is, uh, I would say it's an economic advantage. So there is room to make the argument that they are actually doing the right thing right now and from a purely economic perspective. And they are, uh, you might even see a recovery within two to three years, which is relatively short time. Right. Yeah, yeah. So um, <clears throat> I think there's a lot that we talk about uh, macro stuff. So I want to get into some of the names that you share. For those of you all who are listening who don't know, uh, you know, you run a uh, sub stack, right? Uh, very informative. And you talk a lot about, you know, many different stocks. So, you know, on my list here, I have uh, six. So, uh, I, you know, I know you can go on and on, but uh, let's just do the TLDRs, right, for sure, each of sure. these stocks, right? Um, before I move on to the last segment. Uh, the first one is 7-Eleven. So 7-Eleven is very interesting because uh, I've recently attended their seven cafes. I think it's amazing. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's like a, you feel like a kid in a candy store a bit, right? And uh, also they have caring pharmaceuticals, which um, you have opinions on, right? So I'm not sure if you are a bull or bear on, on, on 7-Eleven. So maybe give, as your thoughts on 7-Eleven's strategy go- moving forward with the 7 Cafe stuff and also carrying pharmaceuticals. Okay, so the I'm sure we, we, where you want to start from is the recent news in Bloomberg where they were saying they could sell, dispose 7-Eleven, sorry, carrying pharmacy for, for this, uh, 400 million US dollars. Right, 1.78 billion ringgit. The current market cap, uh, I'm not sure the latest one, but when I was looking at it about a month ago, it was uh, 1.75 billion. Which is <laughs> more than the market cap. So, <coughs> uh, okay, let's talk about caring. Let's get it out of the way first, okay? So, caring is actually a pretty decent business. Uh, You'd be surprised it has a negative cash flow cycle, mm-hmm. right? Which is something that is very rare in retail, okay? It's one of the things I really look for, and uh, I was very surprised. I don't really understand why, but the fact is it does, like negative one, negative two, right? It's still negative. Uh. So um, they are they sorry just to digress a bit, which explains why they were put into SEM because, yeah, because SEM, SEM also, also has a negative yes CC. cash conversion cycle Correct. guy. Yeah. So um, there is nothing particularly uh, notable or noteworthy about Caring's business per se. I mean, it's a typical pharmacy. You guys know what it is, right? The big advantage. Is that the past year because of the pandemic, they've actually had a really good uh, performance, right? Because people are buying extra masks, buying uh, paracetamol, buying uh, pandemic related stuff, right? He- health stuff, right? And it's not even necessarily because it's required, it's just that people are scared, maybe people are superstitious, so they stock up on, I don't know, health bombs or something, right? The fact is that the revenue has gone up, right? So, um, based on the latest profits, right, they actually can somewhat justify the. I'm talking about the pharmaceutical side of SEM, which is carrying uh, the 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 valuation of one point seven eight billion. I think it's I can't remember what it was already. It was something like twenty or twenty five times, times earnings. Right, right, yeah. right. So the problem with that is that that's the best case scenario. Right, you that's are true. assuming that that will persist. Yeah. And uh, the conservative investor would not assume that. Right? So if we give it that the pandemic has maybe improved their profits by 30% steady, uh, into perpetuity, because there will be an uplift from uh, such an earth-shaking event, health event, right? There will be some improvement in profits, uh, in revenues from pre-COVID. So then uh, I've, I cannot remember the details, but... If we, I think if we assign a 20 times PE, it's only trading at something like... Okay, I cannot remember the number, sorry, but it was not near anywhere near 1.7. I think I assigned 600 million market cap right. to carrying alone. So that's one third of the purported 1.8 billion they could have been sold for. And to be fair, I'm being conservative, right? But uh, I don't think there's any other way to do it. Yeah, yeah. Right? Correct. So that's carrying. So... You deduct 600 million from the current 1.75B, you still end up with like 1.25B, right? So now the question becomes, can 7-Eleven justify the 1.25B? Um, based on 1.25B, they are trading at something like, I think, 50XP. <laughs> right? uh, sorry, 50X EVE. 
Okay, the reason I use EV is because, as you know, enterprise value is market inclusive cap inclusive of debt la. plus net debt, right? Yep. My debt minus cash. Yep. Correct. Inclusive of debt because eventually one day you got to pay the piper. Yeah. So I think, they, I think people call it uh, debt adjusted price, something like that they call it. Yeah. Some people prefer using EV FCF. It's a more yeah. standardized figure, but at the end of the day, it's the spirit of the thing that matters, la. Yeah, I mean, if your if your E and the uh, FCF is more or less the same, then correct, they correct, flip right. a coin, la. So I'm just using EVE for simplicity, yeah. la, okay? So it's like 50x EVE, which is definitely not worth it. La, because yeah. as you know, 7 is not much of a growth business. Yeah, right. even though, I mean, because uh, I've met the management, not not, not the co-CEOs, the guys below. And uh, they, they I, I think they're doing a great job on Seven Cafe. Like they were giving the numbers, it's, double, it's like double the cost to build, but triple sure. or quadruple the revenue. But yes. it's only going to be in certain areas. And so... If only what twenty five percent because they are aiming five hundred only, you got two thousand stores. If five hundred, like how much is it going to add to bottom line? It's it, it's it's relevant the amount, but it's like you say it's not growth. Huh? Yeah, sure. So they are correct, right? Because when you switch from a, a SKU model to a F and B model, right? One one thing is that your your margins go up a lot. Mm. Okay, so I've actually had the privilege of seeing Seven uh, Eleven stores finance finances before the individual stores and uh, they show what the impact because I think that was during recovering from COVID uh, the impact of um, margin improvement I see right and it was huge to the bottom line hmm. so um, the similar kind of thing can happen for it, just to oversimplify uh, your SKU model ty- typically has 30% gross profits your f and model has about 70% oh okay right okay. Uh, your OPEX doesn't really change much it is your capex that changes because you got to set up a kitchen and everything. Correct. Right? It's not up higher, much higher upfront. Correct. Correct. Yes. So your ROE will be impacted, but your net profit will not. Mm. Right. In terms of the opex, right. So if you're just talking about net margins, right, you can reasonably expect a fifty percent increase in net margins. The fifty percent is calculated how. Uh, so thirty to f- okay. So it's between thirty and seventy. We take a midpoint of fifty. If you assume eventually they get to a fifty fifty. Uh, mix between SKU and uh, F&B sales. Yeah. So 30% t- jump to 50%, that's a 66% increase. Right? So 66% increase of uh, gross margins. Then you you filter down to the net. Okay, you assume the same net margin. Uh, okay, anyway, it's all my blog. You're going to read? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, the calculations. So are. what's the, what's the conc- what, what would you say is the conclusion in terms of Valuation? Are you? Uh, it sounds to me that you're on the fence. Am I wrong? To say, right? Yes, I'm on the fence. On the okay, fence. okay, so even if you increase their uh, existing or pre-COVID, right? Right, right. Net profit by fifty percent, yeah. which is what I did. Yeah, uh, you will still get something at twenty-seven yeah. times P, which, to be fair, is fair. Your branded retail tends to trade for about twenty-five X because you are approaching close. Y- your risk is lower. Negative cash flow cycle, right? Uh, you can do financial engineering and also uh, it tends to more mimic a bond if it's a dividend company. So you get different mix of investors, blah, 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 you know. So 27 is close. Sorry, it was 27. I think it's 22. 22. So 22 is only like 15% away from 25. It's not that far, mm. right? That's so upside. La. There's not a lot of upside. Exactly. La, I mean, yeah, not a lot of margin of safety. To, to be fair, I've always called this a low risk, low return kind of investment, something like that. You could say that, yes. Yeah. You could say that. Okay, let's move on. Uh, now, this is very interesting. Uh, then this is actually an inflation play, which is Canadian Railway. Oh, right. <laughs> so Canadian Railway, I know the first time I got uh, acquainted with Canadian Railway is uh, uh, Bill Ackman. Mm-hmm. And he hired this guy called, he, he was, uh, it was another one of these activist bits. And then uh, he hired this guy called Hunter Harrison, right? Yes. To, to solve, to ramp up the, the place. And I think he made tons on uh, Canadian Railway. So without going into too much detail, right? Like oh, I know Without going into too much well. detail. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm confident you can do it. I'm confident you can do, go into detail without too much detail. But the basic idea is what, what, what is the, what's the one, two, three punch for, for railway and how are they linked to inflation? Sure. So on my blog, you can see I call the US rail, railroads, uh, the class one railroads, Class one being defined as either five hundred or nine hundred million of annual revenue above. I forgot. Okay. Okay. okay because okay. people give conflicting mm, definitions. Mm. So um, 
uh, I call them the class one railroads, the picks and shovels of US commodities. Basically, it's a commodities play, but it's the picks and shovels. So the picks and shovels means that, you know, during a gold rush, you don't go and mine for gold. You sell the picks and shovels. Yeah. Right? Or the jeans, are, that's where Levi came into existence, right? Uh, I'm not too sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah mean, okay. like, the, like the Levi, the jeans, yeah, 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 yeah. came because uh, miners needed a pants that was like sturdy. Oh, okay. Yeah, and so jeans are very sturdy, right? Yeah, yeah, and then yeah. it just became a fashion after that. Okay, okay. Oh, I, yeah, didn't, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Cool, 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 cool. That's how Levi got yeah, through all these miners, the gold rush during the yeah, 1800s, yeah, yeah. right? Correct. All right, correct, continue. So, uh, so basically, it's a commodities thesis. So let me start with the commodities thesis first. Uh, there is a, obviously, Ukraine war is one, right? But let's put that aside. There is an extremely, insanely ambitious decarbonization effort going on in the US and the EU right now. The whole US and EU, uh, uh, the, there are two main uh, prongs of it. One is shifting the energy mix towards renewables, away from fossil fuels. And the second one is shifting ice cars to EVs. Okay? So, on the, on the energy mix part, right? Currently, in the US, the energy mix for renewables is something like 22%. We want to get it 50% by 2030 and uh, by 2050, 100%. Okay? That is extremely ambitious. Okay? Uh, I mean, to be fair, these are just theoretical targets, but I can tell you, uh, uh, smart money, I've listened to a lot of people, all say they will never achieve it. <laughs> okay? Especially the Ukraine war. So, just think about the, the math for a bit. Uh. You have... 22% are renewables, 15% of them are hydro and nuclear. Hydro and nuclear are not really scalable, right? Or, or not say not scalable, there are no plans to scale it significantly. Maybe now, yes, with the Ukraine war. But pre-Ukraine war, nu nuclear is a NIMBY problem. You know it's NIMBY? Not uh, in my backyard. Yes, correct. Which correct. means people advocate on it unless it's in my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, then yeah, I yeah. don't advocate for that's it. Why, that's why, like, uh, I think it's like, so my, my view on nuclear is that I think the US should go nuclear. Some parts of Europe should go nuclear because there are a lot of empty spaces, but a country like Singapore shouldn't. Okay, I mean, it's really okay. one mistake is. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. No, actually, a uh, fun fact, right? Uh, Sweden right now, you know, Sweden is part of the, it's not part of the EU, I think. Uh, I'm not sure. La. No, Finland is not. Finland is not. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay, it's, it's in sure. Europe. Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. It's in the European continent. So, um, the average energy price today is about 400 US dollars per, I heard it's per megawatt or something, right? It's high. You'll be surprised, huh? Sweden is only 80. Ah. Why? Because of nuclear. They mm. have a very uh, active nuclear. So, right. Okay, right. going back to the yeah, yeah, sure, thesis. Sure. So, um, you will need a lot of aluminium, copper, nickel, all these things to effect the change to renewables. Right, I think for renewable specifically is aluminium and copper, right? Mm. Zinc, uh, a few others. Uh. For EVs, it will be copper and nickel, right? Your average EV car has about, I think, eight times the copper, uh, uh, needs eight times more copper to build than the, um, ice, uh. the ice cars because copper is the second most conductive metal after silver. Now obviously you're not gonna use silver like, right, to build a car. Yeah. So right, it's like the sweet spot. Lah. So um there are only in the whole world, right? There are uh okay. There are enough copper reserves in the world, but not enough extraction. Sorry. Just to give you an example. The top ten copper global global copper mines in the world, only one of them was discovered in the past century. No way. Yes. No. And you know the way these things work, right? Commodities. It's a compounding thing. And the big guy is a lot bigger than the second guy. Second guy is a lot bigger than the third guy. Right? So it's I the think power law is very scary. Yes, on. correct. It's the power law. So um, if I'm not wrong, right, the biggest is in Chile right now, somewhere in Latin America. And then there's one in the US. Uh, there are a few in China, if I'm not wrong. I can't remember already, right? You get the point, huh? There's no way they're going to dig enough copper. <laughs> so the, the, the smart money, the people I listen to, they actually say that, so car the historical global demand for copper grows at about 2% annually. They're saying, uh, just to oversimplify, at 1% for uh, renewables, at 1% for EV. Right? So you're going to double the amount of copper and supply is, I mean, this, yes, it's a supply chain issue. 
right? You can't just like, you know, financial engineering is right. like copper out of the ground, right? So, um, so how does the trains come in then? Yeah, okay. So basically the, the commodity sorry. stasis are extremely, it looks extremely attractive, uh, including oil and gas, okay? So uh, just, sorry, just to digress a bit. The reason why oil and gas is still going to be uh, very bullish for quite the next 10, 20 years is because uh, they are building, so they are transitioning renewables, but they are taking off fossil power plants. And when you do that, you are actually not increasing your GDP. You are removing productive assets. All you achieve is decarbonization. So there are going to be gaps, uh, okay? <laughs> and those gaps are going to be serviced by uh, fossil fuels, just like coal plants opening in Germany today. Okay, so oil and gas is also looking extremely attractive, and it's just not. I can prove it. A lot of people are saying it. Okay, so um, the way it translates into commodities, uh, into railways, is that there are only the only affordable way to ship bulk commodities in is via, via railways because one long distance, and two uh unit cost unit commodities. I know it doesn't do anything. You just need to ship it, right? You can't you really use trunks. It's too expensive. Right, you have to use railways for long distances. So there are only six class one railroads in the US, not US, the North America. When I say North America, I mean uh, US, Canada, and Mexico. Six only, okay? Technically, there's a seven. Lah. So one just merged. Two, two just merged, right? right? So, and these six, right, they don't even overlap. <laughs> they are all duopolies. So wow. BNSF and uh, Union Pacific control the Midwest. BNSF is uh, Warren Buffett's uh, CSX as well as uh, what's the other one already? Uh, North Fork, North North Fork Southern uh, NSA uh, controls the the Gulf Coast, the Eastern Board, and CP and CNI control the Northwest as well as the the, the Mississippi River to the Gulf Coast, right? And then the, there's a there's a new merger between CP and uh, KCS. Uh, which goes into Mexico. So they're all duopolies, right? Which is one step from monopoly. <laughs> and I'm sure there will be competition, right? But it's still a duopoly. La. You can cartel your way through. La. So that's pricing power. Yeah. Right? And by itself, it's not that attractive because it's still trading at fair value, 20 XP. It has 5% dividend yield, so it's 20 XP, right? It's reflecting that. And... Um, Probably that's why people are not really seeing it. But if you add in a commodities thesis, it goes like that, the thesis, and there's no risk. It's a duopoly trading at twenty XP. I mean, it's literally how, a railway. How, how much? How much risk is there? <laughs> yeah. right. And actually, there's another angle. So, so this is the main thesis for railway. But there's a bonus. Uh. the bonus is intermodal. Intermodal. Okay. So intermodal means different modes of transport. Ship. So you think ah. about. Let's say you buy something from China from a China okay. warehouse. Right, it has to be shipped by by sea to China, to to the west coast of US, taken by rail to the middle of uh the DC the distribution center in the middle of the US, mm -hmm. and then shipped by truck to your home, right? So that's intermodal. Right. Right now, and if you look here, listen to all the all the railway CEOs, right? They are always going on and on this intermodal, 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 intermodal. So you think about it, what do they mean by intermodal? Yeah, of course, e-commerce has encourage a uh, greater need for logistics and therefore greater need to work for, for, for different types of logistics to work together. Right, right. Right. And also the inflation situation has improved the prospects for rail because now people are willing to wait to, uh, a bit longer to get goods delivered a bit cheaper. So rail becomes more relevant. But here's something which I'm not really hearing in the mainstream. Uh. Intermodal can also mean that the railway merge with the trucking companies. Ah yes, because yes. the the railways cannot merge anymore already. The latest class one rail class one guys, I know, the latest class one region between Canadian Pacific and uh, Kansas City Southern is between the north and the south, so they didn't overlap, so they were allowed to merge. Everyone is saying that this is the last class one railroad merger you ever see because beyond that it become monopolies already, right? But what they can still do is merge with trucking companies, right? So trucking is still extremely fragmented. And uh, you are even seeing some like uh, CNI, they recently bought two uh, coal refrigerated uh, trucking companies. Yeah. Right? I think Which, Buffett just got into like driver's yes, trucks, right? Yes, exactly. The, the JC pilot or something. So maybe Buffett is also seeing something which you only will think of if you think in 10-year ten, ten terms. 
right, which is a potential, they can still merge with trucking companies, which means the consolidation of freight uh, may have only just begun, you know. And you are constantly hearing the railway CEOs talking about intermodal, intermodal. They talk about it like it's like a, it's like they're on repeat, you know, <laughs> right? If you actually listen to their interviews. Uh. So, um, if you just think about it in terms of uh, e-commerce improving the prospects of rail, I don't really see la, how much can you improve. La. You know, rail is only 10% of, of US freight right now, right? There's a good reason for that. We don't go into it now. La. But, uh, you know, I don't see it. Just the e-commerce story alone. La, right? So, will you say, I mean, to summarize, this is a, it's, it's a garb kind of stock, meaning the valuations <laughs> don't look optically cheap. But because of some of the protection that it gets from being uh, duopoly, and you know, not only do you need a lot of money to build a railway, you also need sure. the licenses and all that stuff. Yes. Uh, then there's this uh, potential double tailwind of, of course, commodities and consolidation. Would you say that that's the that would be a good way to summarize your views? Yes, it is. It is. Okay. But I would change the gap to completely mispriced. <laughs> complete wow okay yes. the com I, I haven't gone into the commodities thesis. there's a lot of reason to be very bullish on commodities and the best part is even if I'm wrong nothing happens they'll yeah. stay at 20 XP yeah they're paying out their dividends and uh, share buyback total shareholder return 5% annually that's 20 XP how much can it fall it's a dual body you know yeah. <laughs> it's like buying a Walmart you know yeah right there's no reason. I, I mean, I, I I was out of dinner with a friend one day, he, uh, the other day. He was saying it's very it's very dangerous to say no reason. Uh. But seriously, you know, there's no reason. This is like how I was pitching BJ Cobb earlier. Right. Right. We, we, we actually, um, yeah, I didn't put BJ Cobb here. No, no, don't worry. Don't so worry. we won't we, talk we, about it. But I'm, yeah, so we, we talk about railways. Let's talk about the skies a bit. Okay, okay. Uh, Asia, right. Uh, you did talk about Asia the first time we were here. Yes. And the whole, the I remember the thesis, and we also put out a video on Asia a while back, and, and the basic thesis is, look, they have like three ways to raise enough funds to tahan for like two years, uh, assuming there's no comeback. And this was, I think, mid-2021. So obviously now, you know, I think KL Singapore is open already, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Thailand you know, is opening. So all the profitable routes are starting to open. Places like Japan, a bit silly. Uh, the way Japan is handling the whole uh, COVID situation is quite poor in, in, in my view. I'm not sure if you know. I think I they just, just opened something, right? So Yeah, they just opened. But you know, yeah. right? First of all, you, okay, uh, this is a tiny digression, but I think sure, you should sure. know this. My friend has been wanting to go there to propose to the girlfriend. So he has <laughs> always been looking at all the news. And he said it's so silly, the rules now. Number one, you must go as a either two two designations either a tourist or a Japanese company must vouch for you in the business trip okay that's one two when you when you reach there right you need the typical 72 hours swap test and all that and you need to give the Japanese uh, authorities right an itinerary and the itinerary is not I'm going to Tokyo is at 9 to 10 p.m. what are you doing okay and where will you be and then to top it all off you need to be back in the hotel as a foreigner or a gaijin <laughs> at 9 p.m. And not only that, uh, they will FaceTime you. Okay, okay. They will FaceTime you yes. to see whether you are in the hotel. Then you have to show them around, yes, yes, uh, so and so son, you know. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, yeah, it's crazy. I thought I'd share that story. So anyway, Asia. What's oh. the story? Okay, Asia is quite simple. Um, if COVID reflects, the, there, is a, there is still the potential of bankruptcy. It's as simple as that. Ah, okay. No, I mean, if let's say there's a new Enigma variant or something, right, and it lasts for another year or two, uh, there's a good chance they might fail. Like, you know. the, the flip side is that that's a very unlikely because with Omicron crowding out all the other variants, the way the, data, the, the, the virus works is that as it progresses, it becomes more contagious but less severe. Mm. So, it's uh, like a cold. It becomes a correct, correct. Eventually, it becomes a cold, right? Uh, so uh, that seems to be the baseline uh, assumption. Uh. In this baseline assumption, they will do okay because they have revenues, they have cash flows, they have bargaining power over suppliers, right? They can just tell your food caterers or whatever. Ah, okay. uh, either you send me a bankruptcy court or you wait, like, you know? 
And as long as I got my 25 ringgit Langkawi uh, flights, right, even if I'm losing money on it, I will survive, you know, right? <laughs> so, uh, um, the valuation is, so remember, enterprise value over earnings, yep. right, which is an amendment of P, is about 17x, right? At the current price of about 65 cents. I think now it's 60 cents, so it's a bit less than that. Because they have a lot of debt, right, taken during COVID. Uh, when and and uh, just to digress a little bit, when you have so much debt, right, uh, your shareholder dilution doesn't matter anymore, already because your shareholders slice is about twenty percent of the total EV, right? So the even if you mm. even if you dilute by fifty percent, that becomes thirty percent, yeah. right? <laughs> it, it doesn't really matter in the in the catastrophic scenario, that you know. So, um, so. They are trading at 17x, and uh, here is the bull case for them, right? So assuming they survive, right? The great thing, so you know what Manga likes to say, right? Invert, always invert. Mm. So obviously, if you just look at it straightforward, uh, it's quite obvious that they are not in a good shape, now, you know? But here's the thing, all their competitors are not in good shape either. Yeah. Right? So Garuda is currently pretty much in, uh, in uh, what's the word? Arbitration, right? Oh. There is some sort of uh, legal dispute between whether their debts are jurisdic- the jurisdiction is in Indonesia or UK. <laughs> ah. <laughs> because the way the airline sector works, all of them, it's like Cayman Islands, right? They all use the UK Gibraltar, I think, as a as a debt holding or something like that. So that is the ultimate parent company. But of course, Garuda is a flat carrier, right? So the Indonesian government is pushing for Indonesia being the jurisdiction. And under Indonesian jurisdiction, I think they allow them to roll the debt or something. Uh, or I don't know whatever But anyway That's Garuda's scenario They are out of the game already Okay And they are FSC Full service carrier They're not LCC Low cost carrier Malindo Just changed name in the Batik Right Oh I didn't even know this Right wow. So But uh, there's a new There's a new airline That just came out right From an ex uh, Air Asia team My Airlines I think Yes yes Okay They have two I think they have But apparently they locked in Very cheap Prices sure, and, sure. And, and leases uh, That's the only advantage I heard and to be fair, that is a legitimate concern, but let's go into that later, yeah, slightly yeah. later. So, uh, Thai Airways in trouble. The only one that's not really in trouble is Vietjet. Right? So, it's basically a fight between Vietjet, uh, Lion, and uh, Asia. And Asia is the biggest of them. In an industry where economies of scale is all that matters. Because as you get economy of scale, your unit price goes lower, you can offer a lowest price to your customers. And your customer only cares about price in the airline sector. Right? So, Yes, they are in bad shape, but so are all the competitors. Um, it's a it's a it's a triopoly. I don't know what you call it, right? Then uh, back to the my airlines thing. No, you call me some skill. You got two yeah. airlines. What are you gonna do, right? Yeah, you have very good capex, so maybe you'll become a hibiscus, but you're not gonna become a shell, you know? Yeah, yeah, right. Fair enough. So um, I always thought, right? It would think about. So okay, just to digress a little bit. Why did? Buffett by the airlines in 2016. Because he saw a consolidation. Uh, yes, in he's, because once it becomes a, uh, once it becomes a, uh, what's oligopoly, oligopoly yeah. right? Then you can cartel your way through. You mm. can all cooperate to raise prices together. That's what you're seeing in shipping right now. Uh, let me digress a little bit. Yeah. In shipping right now, uh, 80, 85% of the global freight is, shipping freight is controlled by 10 companies. Right now, you know that shipping freight is coming down, right? Because after a blockbuster year last year. So, now they are restrict artificially restricting supply. Okay, I'm not trying to justify it. <laughs> I'm just saying that's what they do. It is what it is. That's yes, what yes. Do. So it's the same story as what Buffett saw in 2016 for the big four US carriers before COVID. Uh, right now you have three. I, I thought this would take about 15 years to happen. 10 to 15 years while the ASEAN growth story uh, takes shape now, you know. We are going to become next China, all right? So it seems like it's already here for 17X. Okay. Uh, Asia has economies of scale. They can bully their way through, just through sheer willpower. And I'm not saying they're going to take down Lion and Vietjet. They don't need to. They can share the pie. Yeah. We're talking about the whole of ASEAN. The whole pie is going anyway. Yes, just to give you some color about what I'm talking about. Uh, ASEAN is the next China. We are already seeing it in Vietnam, right? The discretionary income pool is going to grow like crazy. Which is We're talking about, about the nature story is somewhat linked as well. Uh, yeah, somewhat, somewhat, somewhat yeah. Okay, sorry, continue. Yeah, but Asia much, much more. Of course, of course. Of course. Yeah. So, uh, you know how China grew at double digit growth rate throughout the 2000s, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah you probably see something like that. 
and if they decide to pull the China card, which is to leverage it up further, right? It's all in all likely going to happen. Huh? By itself, already Vietnam is expected to grow at seven percent GDP for the next decade. Seven percent, okay, for a country. <laughs> Some companies don't grow that grow, <laughs> right? So, um, uh, I mean, I don't know lah. You know, as long if you assume they don't die, right? How is this only worth seventeen x? Huh? But when you say seventeen x, right? Why is that attractive to you? Give us a sense because different com- companies, different industries, seventeen x can be high. Sure, it's an oligopoly. So right. you're talking about growth rates of, okay, let's assume ten percent growth rates, just ten. Okay, ten percent growth rate normally you pay fifteen x for that, right? As fair value lah, you know. So um, or even if you say twelve x, whatever lah, you know, right? It's still twelve x compared to seventeen x. That's your country's discretionary income growth rate, not your company's growth rate. Okay, it's going to be shared by three companies who will have pricing power soon. Or expected to, right? And uh, you know, people are saying that right now P vouchers are coming in with like my airlines, right? True, but you still gonna have to compete for economies of scale, which you cannot. You can't build an airline fleet of two hundred company, uh, two hundred planes overnight. Even if you had the money, you can't because of the whole supply of the plane situation. There's only two. It's bags. not just the supply. You have regulation to worry about. Exactly. You have ASEAN is not US. You know, it's not one country. You know, yeah, it's a different smattering. lending rights. Have to yeah, go with different, yeah, different, different. Uh, Okay, there's a qualification here for the pros. There's something called the ASEAN Open Skies Agreement, which can allow you to submit that through the associate. You know, Asia a few more years ago was accused of doing a pyramid scheme through associates. Uh, let's not go into that, but uh, it wasn't. There is a way to submit that, lah, okay? But anyway, it's not so easy still, lah, you right, know, just because right. you have money. But you are basically seeing a development of a potential oligopoly already visible. And you're able to buy for 17x. 17x is like on Netflix a few months ago. Uh-huh. And the greatest part is that in airline sector, uh, regionals don't are not able to easily penetrate other regionals. Europe has tried to go in the US, vice versa, failed. China cannot also will not be able to come here. Right? It's just the way the, the airline sector is structured. Uh. It's not so easy to penetrate another region's market. Uh. And, and likewise for Dubai to here, uh, you know, right? Uh, so which means the competitive space is going to be restricted to these three guys, uh, right? I'm not sure if Philippines, yeah, no, not really, right? yeah. So and the FSCs like uh, Singapore Airlines and the restructured Garuda, as well as Malaysian Airlines, they don't have they don't compete in the same space as yeah, yeah, different, uh, different. So and LCCs are the one who are going to benefit when the poor people become middle middle class. Right, the the lower lower class becomes yeah. the middle class because of traveling and all that. Yeah, you are basically seeing what China saw in nineteen ninety to two thousands, right? And then two thousand to two thousand ten in the coming decade. So think about what that will do for LCCs. Huh? Don't tell me you want to ride a ferry to Indonesia. Huh? No, dangerous. <laughs> it's the same price, you know. Yeah. <laughs> right. so. Okay. Uh, now next one. Uh, Supermax. Oh, so Max, I remember reading yeah, your yeah. thesis is very straightforward. <laughs> lah. They just have a lot of cash. Correct. Yeah. So Supermax, so unfortunately, they are being hit by this ESG thing, which could also be true, right? And uh, I'll be completely honest, I didn't see this coming. Mm. Until this headwind lifts, I don't know what happened to the share price. But let's discuss what if that thing wasn't there, which was where I was coming from before it hit. They are trading at something like I think seven times uh seven times Yeah. Seven times PEX cash uh after including capital commitments. So they have something at like four billion of cash, but something at like two point five billion of uh capital commitments to build their factory in Texas. So those are commitments that you can't you can't remove it. So they have about one point five billion in cash. That translates to about seven XP. Right. And uh, maybe we'll explain more later, but the way value investors tend to think, we don't think in terms of outcomes, right? guaranteed wins, the way most investors think. We think in terms of asymmetric risk reward. So you think we will explain this later uh, if you have time. But if the thesis is asymmetric risk reward, what does Supermax have that is asymmetric risk reward? The way the market is pricing glove companies in general, right, is like they are gone already. Like, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Top Golf is trading at 20x uh, FY19P today. That's something that is quite ludicrous when you consider that they're the 
even when everything, all the new China plants come up, they're still going to be the top five guys, right? In a, again, in an industry where the only thing that matters is economy of scale. In the whole world. You know what's the parallel to this? Netflix. <laughs> okay. Then, um, Supermax, obviously, is not going to compete at the same tier as uh, Top Glove, right? It's going to be maybe within Top 100. I don't know, right? But, so, so, so the profit is not so clear. So they're trading at 7x, right? Like I mentioned just now. But in terms of asymmetric, you see what, right? Here's the thing, right? Your DCF model uh, has one very huge weakness. It assumes the status quo will persist. Yeah. And the status quo being that the current status quo, the pandemic is over, they will, they will just like the current business environment and the incoming supply. The one thing we know for sure is that Seiko's core will not persist. <laughs> right? You think about pre-pandemic top glove, right? If I mean that is why it was valued at that level, right? And also when you went all the way to nine dollars, right, post split, it was also because people were, were assuming the status quo of the pandemic will persist, which it didn't when the vaccines came out, right? I so mean people have recency bias, so that's one of the things that correct people la. have. Yes. So let's assume, let's give the benefit of the doubt to Supermax. Let's say a status quo doesn't persist. How could that materialize? Well, maybe the China plans take a little while, to be longer to come online, right? Maybe there's a there's a, a recession. Maybe the trade war pers- uh, escalates. So now the Western Johnson and Johnsons, your China Perkins, not China Perkins, the other guy, can't remember, right? Uh, are unable to source from China anymore. There's a tariff, so it makes it more attractive to source it literally next door regionally. Right, who's the biggest guys? Top Gear Hatalega, you know. Right, I mean, after the Chinese, we, we are the biggest, right? Pretty much, sure. yeah. Like, after Blue Sail and the other guy, what's his Inco. name? Inco, yeah, Inco, correct. Then, um, trade war is a really, really reasonable scenario that you should be putting into your DCF right now. Okay, it's definitely not in the share price right now. Okay, and then what happens if a fire breaks out <laughs> in a China factory? Mm. Right, or I don't know, something like you know. So my point is that there is no risk, you know, at 7xp, right? The asymmetric risk side, the risk side of asymmetric risk, what is is pretty much barren. Uh, oh, sorry, 7x was at one dollar. Today it's 75 cents, so it's probably closer to five, mm. right? I mean, five is no growth already, you know, right? That's what I'll buy a private company for already, right? Which means that the downside is extremely limited, lah. And if the so of course you can make the case that it may not go up either, you know. It can go up to one dollar, maybe not too much beyond that, if the status quo persists. But like I said, one thing we can be sure of is the status quo will not persist. Even if it goes pers- it is changes to the downside, it will not go down at 5x already. If it goes to upside, it can double and triple. Yeah, correct. So the idea I will explain later, you know, value investing philosophy is that if you have 20 supermaxes, right? And all of them has limited downside and double triple upside. You are basically a casino already. You are the house playing the the, the odds. You may not necessarily know who is going to win or lose, but from a statistical standpoint, hopefully you are at least decent at your job, You know, you are probably going to get it right on maybe half, and you're going to get it wrong on maybe half, right? Which means if your half that gets it wrong only drops ten percent, and the half that gets it right is doubles. Yeah. It's Can you not make your fifteen percent, Kiga? Yeah. So that is, that is how Supermax fits into the puzzle, right, and right. the pro guys who understand asymmetry is reward will understand what I'm talking about. They will appreciate it. We don't look for maximum guaranteed wins because you guys are also doing it, the retail guys. And what is the advantage of us from you, right? You can see the upside also, right? That's why managing the downside is very important as well. But yeah. we'll get into that later. Fair, fair enough, yeah. fair enough. Okay, so Suma is relatively simple. In nature, this one, um, I looked at it, I've profited from it. Uh, you but the story from it? Profited, profited. Okay, okay. Um, however, the, the big question for In nature has always been growth. Yes. Right? Uh, Vietnam is, in theory, on paper, the, the growth story. Yes. But... Yes. Uh, they it's it's hard. This competition sure, sure. is very high. Sure. So, what are your thoughts on uh, in nature? Okay, just to do a bit of marketing for them. <laughs> uh, 
the CFO, COO and CEO have been buying stock recently. Mm. Okay, you can go and see. And uh, you know, Peter Lynch is a saying, right? Uh, management sells stocks for many reasons, but they only buy for one, which is that they think it will go up. Okay, so um, let's put Vietnam aside for a while. Okay, let's just focus on Malaysia. The great thing about E-Nature is that they have pricing power. They are branded retail. So one of the reasons why I earlier mentioned that branded retail tends to trade at 25x PE is because they are very safe stocks. They're very pretty, like Starbucks. Starbucks is trading at something at 22, right? Uh, 7-Eleven is trading at 27. No, right, 50, right? <laughs> right? You, you get my point, right? So, a, a, and you look around, Coca-Cola is trading at 20 plus. The HQ Starbucks in US is trading at 30... 40, I think, I don't know. Right? You get the point that uh, branded retail is not the same as retail. Because retail is very commoditized. I open a chicken rice store, you open a chicken rice store, there's not much difference between a chicken rice store, right? So we fight on price, uh, it's a price wall. Uh. But one day my chicken rice store gets featured on TikTok, right? And then it becomes a big thing, and then people are talking about fried egg rice, chicken rice, you know. <laughs> right? So it becomes a brand. My product is the brand already, it's not really my chicken rice. Then I can raise the price because I'm not competing with you. You're not selling the brand. Right? And in, in nature's case, so, so think about Coca-Cola versus some no-name soda. You know what I mean? Uh, in nature's case, they're not really selling skincare. I mean, to be completely honest, right? I've used their skincare products before. It doesn't really, high, it's not really high quality, like, you know, for the amount of money. It's, it's something like 80 ringgit for a typical skincare. Your L'Oreal is really 100, it's only 120. L'Oreal, when you put it on your skin, right? It feels like mean, you know? Huh. <laughs> right? It feels fresh, you know? The other one is, it feels a bit like a Tesco skincare kind of thing. It's not really that great, right? And you're paying like, I think eight times the unit price of a Tesco, you know, the, the big bottle face wash. So honestly, the product is not value for money, you know? And that is the typical complaint I get. But you got to remember that they are, they are okay, you, they are recurring revenues, right? Defined as people who buy one, uh, at least two body shop Visit a store two times to buy a year, like, at least. means recurring customer. Like. And keep in mind, they are selling skincare. Skincare lasts like three to four months, right? One bottle. So it's 50% of the revenue. Okay? So, um, uh, so the, the thing they are really selling is not really this, the, the product. It's the brand. What do their brands stand for? Environmentalism environmentalism, uh, women empowerment, as well as uh, fair trade, right? So you get people, the people who buy body shop products are the ones who want to see their money benefiting the mothers in Kenya who are making their face cream or who want to see uh, turtles being released in the hatching and then making it to the ocean, <laughs> right? And if you look at the body shop's annual report, right, as well as their general marketing, they do all, kind, all this kind of thing. Right, uh, under instruction of HQ. So the reason being that they understand that they're not really selling the product. Right. To be fair, the product is okay, lah. You know, it's okay, lah. But it's not worth the money, lah. You know? I can find more competitive products elsewhere, and yet people buy it. Right. Their revenue is not really great, but it's not dipping either. It's not declining either. Right. So and yeah, the whole subscription model, right? Like, uh, yeah, people, yeah. I can't remember what is it called, already, but. They have like something like 300,000 subscribers for their products. True. Not too relevant to the okay. valuation. But at the same time, at least it's not negative growth, line, you know, right? So, I mean, it's body shop, right? It's not that hard to see the, 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 the business justification for it. So, um, sorry. So, it's, it's a branding thing and they, can, they have pricing power. Right, they can raise prices. So recently, they raised prices by fifteen percent. I suspect it is why their latest quarters results revenues haven't grown, right? The way you would expect pent up demand to influence it, because it's affecting your volumes, ah, right? But it's a temporary thing. It's not a, or at least we can assume so. Normally, like Starbucks, they raise the price. You know, after you complain a little bit, right? After three months, you get used to it. Then you just go back. Because that's, first of all, you can afford it if you're visiting Starbucks, right? And second of all, uh, yeah, I mean, there is a, it's, it's, it's a branding thing. It's branded retail. This is the power of branded retail. Okay, so, uh, and if you look at 
the likes of Seas Candy, the likes of uh, I don't know Unilever, Kraft Heinz, Buffett's favorite, and even Bill Edmonds' favorite sector is one of them, uh, branded retail, right? Uh, Burger King, you know. So, um, so is it really just a case of it's it, sh- it it's not where it should be essentially like oh yes it, the the valuation is what currently it's 50, 50 cent I think it's like 10 250 million market cap right no the the valuation size is oh it 10, P, is it yeah it's it. yeah you're correct so okay typically right for a for a no growth branded retail like uh 7-Eleven Malaysia as well as Coca-Cola in the US it trades that come at around like 25 XP okay so the reason being that uh, people like me will be willing to pay a bit more for it Okay, that's what the fair value is. In nature, it's currently trading at 12. Yeah. Okay, and uh, even if you make the case that, okay, you want to be super conservative, even a non-branded retail trading at, that has no growth, will trade at 10, at fair value, correct? Right, so it's trading at 12. And how you want to justify the extra 2x? Vietnam. Uh. <laughs> Vietnam has GDP growth of 7%. <laughs> Not your individual company. And, you can easily make the case that if I went and start a business in Vietnam, it's probably going to be really difficult. But if you're already an established brand, Starbucks, Coca-Cola, Body Shop, you want to appeal to the rising discretionary income who have greater materialistic influences, right? Mm. Who want to try what the Americans have, what people in China have, right? Uh, typical materialism, like, you know? Uh... It's pretty easy to make a case for body shop at least matching seven percent GDP growth, at least. And, and I do know their dividends are quite attractive as well. Right? Oh yeah, yeah. So, okay. So, so the valuation is like this, right? They are, they are, they are pre-COVID. Let's assume they can go back to pre-COVID eventually. Okay, pre-COVID profit is thirty million. Pre-COVID dividend was twenty million. In fact, last year's uh, dividend was seventeen million. <laughs> okay, even though they were in the doldrums. Um, current market cap I cannot remember It's close to 300 million So you're calling it 10xp Right And uh, I was saying 12x earlier right? So uh, Currently it's 50 cents So 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 let's assume uh, Sorry I cannot Off the head recall. Okay The dividend yield Based on 20 Million dividend Paid And the current market cap Is something at 5.5% Okay, and one thing you can be sure of like, they will survive one. Uh, let's put Vietnam aside, just Malaysia. They will survive one, and two, there will be a retail upcycle eventually, where it will become overvalued. Yeah. Okay. So let's say you think it's fairly valued at twelve. I don't know. Yeah, you can still go to fifteen. It you can still go to seventeen. It. Maybe just while you're collecting those dividends. Meanwhile, you're collecting those dividends five percent, right? So um, uh, you are just waiting, collecting dividends while you wait lah. That's the entire thesis. Right? And there's optionality. Again, no downside. How much downside can it be at the current price? Right? Uh, upside optionality exists, like the Supermax example. And it is both an inflation and deflation hedge. So even if just for portfolio positioning, which I know retail investors may not be too interested, but for the institutional investor, it's both. You scare inflation in nature. You scare deflation in nature. So why? Uh, inflation can be counted by pricing power. They have pricing power. The inflation can be counted by the fact that they are a huge dividend payer. Right? When when during recession typically you want more dividends. So um it's both a it's a great macro hedge. Right? Uh yeah. So from my perspective as an institution investor as well as uh you know, people who like to hear this kind of thing, it's a very easy sell. Right. Yeah. Keep in mind that institution investors we tend to have what eight percent Kegel with Target, uh, yeah. targets, yeah. So you already get a guaranteed five percent, you know. I just need three yeah. percent per year <laughs> for that five year holding period. <laughs> you yeah. think it's you think it's difficult? <laughs> and enough. no risk, you know. <laughs> this is not like a C limited, you know. True, true, true. No, uh I know you've talked a lot about other stocks as well. So guys, if you want like the full meaty version, please uh, head over to Substack. Make sure you put your email in, right? So that you get notified A and then B. Uh, support Aaron. Now we go. We will talk less about stocks now. Um, 
and go into something that you're very passionate about, which is really how you define value investing. You alluded to using, talking about the house and things like that, asymmetry and all that, giving us piecemeal descriptions of uh, your conception of investing. But uh, I do know that uh, since the last time we met, you have updated views, mm. right? On investing based on your experience, based on your nine months of arduous writing. What is it? What's, what's new? Okay, nothing is new because everything is just copied from Buffett. Mm -hmm. The only thing new is the new, the like, word. like new information. To you. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> okay, so um, basically, I would like to uh, propose that value investing is really a superior philosophy, investment philosophy, right? Because of what I will explain later. So, if you think about how most investors invest, right? It tends to be uh, we invest for maximum profit, right? And you try and identify what will happen in the future with accuracy through elbow grease, right? So you put in the work, uh, you are DCFing, so you are forecasting what's going to happen, right? There is one big problem. So a typical DCF model, like, you know, your revenue forecast, your cash flow forecast, your discount rate. There's one big problem with doing it this way, which is that the future hasn't existed. It doesn't exist, right? As evidence. Okay, as evidenced by the fact that we didn't foresee, I think, the six different yo-yos that happened in the past two years, macro yo-yos, right? So, it's very easy to say, oh, you know, I should have seen, okay, maybe not Ukraine war, I should have seen inflation coming, right? But let's say I turn the question around, I say, what is inflation going to do this time next year? You feel a bit lost, right? That's because you don't have 2020 hindsight. When you look back, you do have 2020 hindsight. When you look forward, you will never have 20 hindsight. Which means, this is what Buffett means by it's always clearer in the rear view mirror than the windshield. Which means that DCF method of forecasting, right, which is pre the presumption has uh, doesn't work because it starts with the presumption that there is something to analyze to begin with when in fact there is none. Okay? So, the problem is that we always judge uh, investors' performance based on what has happened, right? And um, that's not really the correct way to strategize in terms of forward-looking investments, uh, right? Like, let's say, uh, okay, China Tech now is in the doldrums. What do you think it's going to do next year? It's, it, it's very easy to beat up the people who were invested in China Tech last year and now it's down, right? But uh, what about next year? What about two years later? What about five years later? You know how many things happened in the past two years? Right? Uh, yeah, tell yeah. me about it. No, the thing is that, right, if you cannot uh, apply the same framework that you use to judge historical performance in an actional manner for a forward-looking investment strategy, that means that the historical thing doesn't work. Lah, right? So I give you a very good example. Lah. Uh, let's say Tesla. So Tesla, okay, I know Tesla has come down a bit, okay, but let's just move the the goalposts to last mid of last year, the peak of Tesla. Okay, so for, let's say call it mid 2019 when Katie Woods first came in until mid 2021. So it's a straight line up, right? And then people will say, oh, you know, uh, we if, if let's say in mid 2021 you look back, and in fact Katie Woods was going around saying, I saw this. I knew it would coming. I'm I'm great. And then the question back like, you know, if you're so great, why didn't you see it crash also later? Like, you know? But the thing is this, right? If it goes up, uh sorry, it has gone up, and then um what were the reasons it went went up in those two years from mid 2019 to mid 2021? First of all, there was COVID, which was very good for tech stocks. Second of all, Elon Musk took a huge risk in terms of uh keeping a semiconductor supply flowing. He didn't cancel orders, while all his peers cancel orders, which is why they were stuck with the semiconductor backlog. So that was a huge risk because even he could not have known when the pandemic would end, right? So he was lucky it ended in November. Let's say it ended the following November, he may not be so lucky anymore, right? It's cash burn, you know, when you can't sell cars in a pandemic with lockdowns, right? Third, um, Biden won the US election in end of 2021 
on uh, sorry end of 2020 yeah end of 2020 November 2020 on the Green Wave platform and then once he was in power he pushed ESG very very hard so these two things were also very good for Tesla stock and that, that was not obviously in Musk's uh, most probably like Musk's yeah. uh, assessment pre-assessment correct no in the yeah correct so in mid in mid 2019 neither Musk nor uh KD Wood could have known this in advance, right? So it was only in mid 2021 that they go and uh, tell the story that they saw it. But actually, that is not true. So this is a, what we call hindsight analysis or survivorship bias, right? In the sense that we already, we already, uh, we already uh, profit, we, we already outperform. And even though we didn't see it, right? We were lucky, right? We go and tell ourselves a story. Oh, I should. We use today as a reference point to to come here, right? So that's what we do all the time, right? As investors. Yeah, and I mean, just to share a personal story, I think for me is uh, Supermax. Okay. Right? In 2019, I chose Supermax because, I mean, of the four glove companies. So wait, before that, like, my whole idea of gloves back in the day was that um, it wasn't to say in the door rooms, but they were not really performing sure and uh but i knew that the demand situation was was quite good it was double digit growth kind of situation right across the board now i didn't quite know which one to pick of the top four because i felt it's very commoditized then you can maybe make the case that automation for other is better or whatnot right but valuations are sort of higher and so i just picked the two uh top glove and supermax mm. Right, Supermax specifically because it was it was just cheap. That's it. It was like it was the cheapest among all of them. Sure. And uh, I bought in like late November, early December, twenty nineteen. Obviously, I was confident that I could make money from that. But then, the thing crashed thirty percent, and then we all know what happened right after that. Right, it just bounced back up almost yep. a twelve x, I think, something yep. like that. And that was one of my best. Uh, Investments ever because I once it went up like five x I topped out again and then it doubled from there. Sure. To become the eleven x. Sounds like I'm boasting, but just to prove your point, when I put on the investment, I didn't think that COVID was so big. I knew that COVID existed, but then in my head, it's like ah, bird flu, you know, bird flu, avian flu, whatever lah. Mm. But I didn't know it was going to be a massive lockdown and all these things will happen. So just to conquer with your point like sure, sure. Uh, you, you need to figure out I think as an investor what you can attribute to your analysis and yes. what you cannot and so for me I'm only willing to attribute maybe the first two X of the Supermax gains to yeah. my efforts or whatnot. but the everything remainder which is the 80% of the returns is not from me did you say at the top? Uh, it was a 12 20 X I saw at 11 or there. okay okay yeah. so again it's lucky because I knew and the reason was because uh I saw was because I know, right, looking at Malaysian counters, I, I think in general, so like, things don't go out that fast. One. Now, admittedly, yeah, this yeah. is a non fundamental reason, but from a psychological reason, right, things don't go up that fast. Yeah, yeah. They can't, they can't return six years to get one. Yeah. But since it, I got that in four or five months, right, I said, yeah, something's up. Even though I think the company is decent, but it's time to cut. So I just trimmed okay. along the way and then I sold off, uh, I think, by. July something like that, yeah. And actually, this is a called asymmetric is what? So huh? this is asymmetric is what? Yeah. Because even though you're uncertain, you decided to cut because it was you thought it was overvalued, mm. right? Okay, so um, and it's also the same that when we consider the stocks that our stock performance today, right? We would say things like, "Oh, I should have saw that coming," or we would even go around saying, "Oh, I saw that coming," mm. right? When if you're honest with yourself, yeah, probably not lah, you know, right? So, um, um, what we're trying to drive here is that, uh, I'm trying to figure out how to phrase it. You are, you are trying not to, sorry. Okay, you can't actually use the same framework that uh, delivered your historical outperformance for the future because it is false. Yeah. It's all just about people using hindsight analysis to reverse cycle themselves. But you see, that's the interesting thing, right? Because when we assess, 
when we when we build frameworks, when we assess all this, right, it is based on past data, right? So it's yes. always that interesting discussion of past data is not future performance. Mm. But then, you know, there's a difference between, to use a crude example, uh, there's a difference between dating a girl who has never been with someone before okay. versus a girl who has been with 20 other guys before. Okay. Don't tell me that, you know, that there isn't an effect. Yes, of Th- course. You, you should factor in that, you know, perhaps number 21, you will be the one, right? But then you also have to ask, like, will there be 22? You know what I mean? Yes. Okay, so the way I will address that is that there's a difference between volatility and volatile fundamentals, mm. right? Because the way people tend to think of, so using your feeling example, right? right. The feeling example means that uh, you don't know exactly where it's going to be eventually, but it's going to be up there, right? So you can draw a straight line through it and then ignore all the all the wavy, the volatility. When in fact, the one thing that I would say the majority of investors don't really capture is that macro affects your fundamentals. Mm, right? Yeah. The past two years is enough examples. Right? We had this and that and this and that and this and that and this. <laughs> I can literally name that all now. So, um, I mean, just look at how the Ukraine will affect oil and gas stocks. Uh. It went up because of that. Clearly, I didn't predict it. And yet, it affects their fundamentals. So this is what I mean by there's a difference between volatility and volatile fundamentals. Once you throw in the macro equation, right? Remember what I said earlier about how the DCF model doesn't assume the status quo persists? It assumes the status quo persists because it assumes that the company or even the sector operates in an isolated system. That it has no business environment. Correct. And that's the, the macro is, that you're referring to? Yes. The, 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 the fact is that there is no isolated system. Macro can influence your internal system, right? So when your okay, let's say an oil and gas stock, when you came one hit, right, your discount rate changes, your terminal value changes, right, and that just throws off your earlier MPV to the upside. Fortunately, uh, but tech will be the reverse of inflation. You you see, what I'm saying. So when you add the macro element into the volatile fundamental equation, you start being able to just DCF your way through a valuation already, right? So uh, that just to answer your question, uh, okay. But coming back to what I was saying earlier, right? The reason why this doesn't work, right, is because this is a very hindsight analysis kind of approach. The fact, right, that you cannot feel confident doing the same thing for the future. Let's say I ask you to do exactly the same thing, the same analytical methods, try and figure out which is the next Tesla in the next two years. Yeah. You will draw a complete blank. Am I right? Yeah. You don't even know where to start. Yeah, well, the president might be different. Yes, and right. you know how would you be able to potentially reconcile this? Yeah. Maybe the historical models are all wrong. Right. Okay. So isn't that where margin of safety is the, the genius? Yes. The reason being that, okay, remember earlier how I was going on about asymmetry is what? If you cannot identify the future in advance and then with hard work and then, uh, you know, just identify and analyze it and then, and then you know for sure. Right, with certainty. Then the only way, which means a top-down method, right? The only way to approach it is from bottom up. So think about how a business approaches their future, right? Let's say uh, a restaurant, right? So let's say it's a bakery, and the bakery needs to know budget for the amount of flour it needs to, uh, for inventory, and maybe what the wages are going to be, right? And then. Uh, derive a future profit uh, forecast, right? That is not the same as uh, I know how much my company is going to be sold for in five years' time and there is no room for error at all, right? What they will do is they will budget to the best of their ability. That's the upside. And then they will ask themselves what's the downside, Yeah. right? Oh, inflation maybe will go up. Oh, yeah. maybe I have not enough foreign labor. I think I think that's a very good point because uh, when, you know, we talk about entrepreneurship a little bit early on, you know, before this and we talk about how the natural spirit is that that gung ho upside thinking only right but uh, I always remember what Monish Prabhupada talked about which is that actually the best business people are the guys who assume no risk yes that's exactly true Um, like Bezos right yes I mean first of all he had a pretty wealthy father he could borrow money 
right? Uh, certainly above average, lah, right? In the yes. US context, could borrow like two fifty k, I think, in the late nineties. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, even today, if you want to borrow two fifty k, like you know, you better justify, right? Mm. And if he failed, he could have gone back to D yes. right to work. Correct. Bill Gates, said, well, Bill Gates, I mean, parents are already, I mean, top one percent kind of situation, right? Send him to a school that had the only computer in the whole nation. Yeah. Right, and of course, he had, he lucked out by meeting people like Paul Allen and all that. Mm. And parents were really wealthy, so if he failed, then just go back to Harvard Law or whatever. Correct. Uh, Buffett is the actually Buffett is the perfect example, right? He always says this, and I I appreciate this from him is that he say you know people can be impressed by his ability. You know, you watch the documentary, you read book, everything is just book leaking about him. Yeah. But when you ask him what attributes success, what well, he say, well, one, I'm male, born in the thirties, I'm white. And he doesn't say this often, but I mean, he, his dad introduced to him stock investing when he was seven. Yeah. His dad is a stockbroker. And a congressman. And a congressman. <laughs> and his neighbor is the CEO of Coca Cola. Okay. Right? That was later, right? That oh, was a yeah, bit later. that was earlier, yeah. Correct, uh, what's his name really? Roberto uh, Gonzalez or something? So, so something like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, then, then um, you know. He had all these advantages, and so to attribute it to his analytical ability is, uh, I wouldn't say it's wrong, but it's very incomplete. Yes, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, it's true, it's true. Um, yeah, but I mean, going back to the concept, yep. the topic of risk, right? The problem about risk, right, is that it's not an average distribution the way you think of like uh, video game health mm, points, mm, mm, right? Mm. You get hit and then, and then you get potion or whatever, right? Risk is like a light switch, you know, right? You, if risk materialize, gone case, you are dead, right? If it doesn't materialize, then you are fine, right? But there's no in between. Risk is potentiality, right? That's yes. The thing. So the problem is that people tend to think of risk as an average thing when they're making decisions. So you say, oh, okay, uh, he could do this, he could do that. Which is why people like beta, right? It is essentially that calculation of mm, actually not the actually standard deviations and all that yeah yeah obviously, yeah. obviously. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, but yeah, I mean I, using I, the I usage of standard deviation or like Gaussian statistical methods is that to what you sure, say that sure, is correct. the normal distribution yes, but yes. as we know thanks to people like Nassim Taleb no the risk the tails can be very very correct, correct. fat so there's a very famous uh, this is how Mark's friend he, of Oak Tree Capital so his name is Elroy Dimson he's the Professor of Emeritus of London School of Economics. He has a very good quote which, which encapsulates risk. He said, risk is more things can happen than will happen. Mm, which correct. means that if the risk materializes, you fail completely. There's no redemption. If the risk doesn't materialize, you win completely. But there's no in between. Right? Which means uh, that uh, today, before the risk has materialized, right? you may be have the privilege of seeing it as an average of which you want. But if the risk, it will only take one of two paths, correct? Risk is more things can happen than what happen. And if it takes the other, the, the, the risk path, right? It's not an average result of it anymore, you know? You have to consider it's a complete loss with no redemption, you know, right? Similarly, if it goes up, it goes up. So in Elon Musk's case, let's say Biden didn't win the election. There was something not within his control. He took a risk. The stock could have crashed. Let's say uh, the pandemic lasted longer than right? instead of November 2020, it took until November 2021. No cars during driving on the road, nobody's buying EVs either. And Trump won. <laughs> right? Um yeah, you know, the stock probably wouldn't have done so well, like, you know, right? Yeah, I mean China allowing the Shanghai Giga Factory, a lot of yes. things are. Yeah. But here's the problem. Later on, right, when people look back with hindsight analysis, they would think that there was only one possible path. The, 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 the future was already predetermined. And therefore, as long as at the beginning I do enough work, I will have identified. Yeah, that's a very dangerous. Uh, which I just demonstrated is untrue. It's very dangerous. Yeah. Right? So if you think that way, right, and you apply it for the future, right, and you are trying to find the next Tesla, right, well, the risk that Tesla took could have ended up making it the next Tencent, you know, you know what I mean? <laughs> so it's binary end. And it's one or the other. It's not an average of it. So, risk small things can happen, they will happen, are you? And this is also the failure of hindsight yeah. analysis. 
So, which means the only way you should approach uh, the future, right, in terms of strategic thinking, is asymmetric with what? Which is that you need to recognize that either can happen and you don't know. By definition, this is uncertainty, you know? It's mainly uncertainty. And because you don't know, you have to prepare for both. And you have to ensure that even if the down, okay, obviously nobody worries about the upside. If you are right, good, you know? But you have to ensure that if the downside materializes for any reason, you still never yeah. lose money. Rule number one: never or that lose it money. Is, or that the damage is limited. Yes, and inevitably, if you do that, you are spreading yourself thin. You are not going to be a top performer in any given period, la, Any given year, la, But right? you are sacrificing that top performance for limited. Ironically, downside. more guaranteed performance are over. No, long. actually, you're not sacrificing anything. Because the guys who take the risk and then it didn't materialize a given year and right, then right, who right. become first quintal per quarter performers. Or rather performers, the potential for top performance, rather. Correct. Right. Will also be taking the same kinds of risks which will destroy their portfolio yeah. later on. Yeah. A great example is Top Glove. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> actually, right. actually uh, to your point, right? And this is classic. Uh, I think very few people will get this based on what you said. There's a, there's a picture floating around. I actually shared it with our community, I think uh, a couple of weeks ago about um, Bill Gates. I think when he owned like half of Microsoft or something, he spoke to Buffett and then Buffett said, you, like, you should diversify. So he diversified and then he gave that guy, I can't remember his name, the some money, the guy managing the Gates Foundation money. Okay, Cascade. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so he uh, he managed it. It, it did okay, lah, right? It did, you know, he bought some book trade away, things yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. But then someone calculated, wow, if he never sell, right? His Microsoft share, right? You he'll be worth like two hundred fifty billion or something like that. Correct. Like uh, you know, the lesson you know, don't listen to uh, uh, to Buffett and all that. Yeah. But to your point, right? But I but my view is that it still made all the sense in the world for uh, correct uh, 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 Gates to do it because you are saying it based on what has happened and that single path yes. that has happened. But you wouldn't be here if something different happened. One, right. two, uh, fr- from a more psychological perspective as an investor, if you are Bill Gates, yes, maybe you are worth two hundred fifty billion, but everything is linked into everything is tied to your Correct. stock. And I don't, I I just don't see how, especially someone at Bill Gates's uh, position. Uh, can like how that's healthy for him going yeah, forward yeah, yeah. now again this is coming back to the what I said earlier about predetermined paths right predetermined futures the guy who is saying that oh if he had he had stayed on uh, he he would have been worth 250 billion now is making one underlying assumption which is that there was only one path that could have been taken and therefore as long as in those 20 years he had the foresight he would have seen that and had stayed invested. And that you knew beforehand. Let's, let's count the amount of things that has happened in since 2010. La, just 10 years only. La. Okay. We had the GFC. We had the Euro crisis. Yeah. We had the, Gre- the Greece crisis, Euro crisis. Yeah. We had uh, the, the, we had China coming and save the world, right? The economy, global economy uh, with the yeah. leverage. Uh, China, the 2015 capital controls. Two. Oh, oh yeah. Capital controls. We had the Arab Spring. Property we had pressure. Brexit. Have you, do, you, do you guys even remember this anymore? Yeah. <laughs> right? Then we had uh, we had the table tantrums too, right? 2014, 2018. Trump. We had Trump. Uh, also uh, again. Annexation of Crimea. Uh, yes, right? 1MDB. One 1MDB. One <laughs> you had uh, four Malaysian presidents in, uh, mm, prime ministers mm. in, four, in four years. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Which obviously Bill Gates, uh, I mean, it doesn't matter to him. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you had all, and then you had COVID and then the six macro yo-yos that subsequently happened. Right, all these things will have affected Microsoft stock yeah. uh, significantly. Here's the interesting thing. Let's say you could transport back in time uh, to 2010 to the guy who said that, and you say that all these things were going to happen. Will you tell Bill Gates to still hold Microsoft share? No la, Why? Why use Bill Gates example? Ah? Why don't you use Bitcoin as example? Mm. Right? Why didn't you see Bitcoin then? Yeah. The reason yeah. is because at the time Bitcoin was looking like I don't know. Like like Aaron Coin right now, <laughs> is is worth nothing. You know, there's no support. 
It's only because you have a pre uh, hindsight analysis with 2020 hindsight. You look back yeah. and you make the assumption that that was the only possible mm. path that could happen. Yeah. The reality is, I mean, come on, uh, there are so many things that could happen to Bitcoin. Uh. Yeah, I, I think the the, <laughs> the, the, the the proof for for Bitcoin specifically, someone was, because it's public wallets, you can track, right? Someone came out with a stat that I think like 99.5%, I think, of the shareholders on the early days of Bitcoin are completely different today. Yes, of course. There was somebody who paid like 12,000 Bitcoin for pizza, right? Two pizzas. No, no, that was the very first transaction. Lah. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. you're referring to that, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, no, so because we are, no, because I'm in the field uh, somewhat also. So, okay, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, lah, the pizza was the classic. Lah. They call it pizza day. Yeah, lah. So, so why did he pay if he knew in advance? Mm. Or is it he didn't do enough work to forecast, is it? Yeah. <laughs> right, then why don't, I, why don't you buy my Aaron coin? No, now? how would he even know that he needed to do work? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So the point being that when you're talking about large time spans, right, 10 years, 20 years, right, yeah. there's just no way uh, you're going to predict accurately what's going to happen. In all likelihood, the chance of you actually getting it right uh, is about 1%. Yeah. So on those odds, right, is there any top-down methodology which actually will work on it? The only way thing you can do is bottom-up, which is yeah. step by step. And of course, when you do this, you are doing bottom up, right? You can get it wrong also. Lah. Just like Buffett got COVID wrong for the airlines. And to be fair, you it's not like he could have predicted it anyway, right? If COVID didn't happen, I'm sure he would still be holding it because they are still the oligopoly, right? So you can still underperform based on hindsight analysis. But statistically speaking, okay, hopefully you're holding a sufficiently diverse. I don't want to really go too deep into it. Let's just stick with the diversified portfolio as an example. Lah. You got 20, 30 stocks. Every single one of them is like what I described just now. Limited downside, high upside. You do very well. Yeah, yeah. you would make a 15% kicker. Mm. It's almost, tell me, it's almost a guarantee, isn't it? Almost, yeah. Cool. Yeah, you will be rich. And how many people can I take? It's just the key is to wait and to maintain that, that diversity. Lah. Yes, correct. Just, just trust in the process. Yeah. In the sense that uh, the math is apparent, right? Your downside is, I don't know, maximum 20%. Your yeah. upside is double, right? You only need it to, your whole portfolio on average should double uh, once every five years yeah. to get 15% Hager, right? And hopefully some might even triple. So let's say you get half right, half wrong. Let's hope you are at least at, as decent as that. Lah. Don't get all wrong. Lah, you, know? mm. you can afford to be wrong, you know. You can be afford to be wrong on one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, uh. mm. <laughs> and then the other ten is correct, uh, yeah. and you still get a fifteen percent kicker. I mean, case in point, I used to train a lady. I, I think this is the last one I make, and then I think we're gonna uh, end the podcast. But yeah, yeah. Uh, I still remember last time because I was in the investment education line as well. There's this lady who came up who just complained, uh, like, you know, I've money in the stock market is not doing well, and that how how to help me. I think her, I think she had a million right in her portfolio. Now here's a startling thing, right? I looked at it and 95% of 90 to 95, something I can't remember the exact number of the stock was public bank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So that was a huge insight to me because obviously if she allocated 95% at the beginning, she wouldn't be flat, mm. right? Public bank did so well over like a 20 year period. But the fact that it was 95% told me that, wow. So, right, and then she had like a whole like potpourri of stocks lah. Hmm. 45 whatever it is that means right if you assume it was an equal allocation right literally one guy right was literally preventing the entire portfolio from getting negative yeah. so if you add a second one that's it so yeah Aaron I uh, oh, I know no, there's always more let, let me let me just yes. end with uh, yes, yes. to emphasize the the concept of executing is what just let me mm -hmm. end with a short story mm -hmm. yes yes Many people point to George Soros as the ultimate trader, right? He yeah. bonk, the ultimate speculator. He broke the Bank of England, right? Do you know, right, that when the the when he broke the Bank of England that trade, the pound short trade, his why was he so gung ho to leverage the firm, uh, double the entire firm, to bet the house on it, and then therefore secure his legacy? The reason is because, right. The market was so confident that the UK would not exit the EIM, right? Uh, can I go into a little bit of context for a minute? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. No because 
okay, the time it was like the EU la. It was the precursor to the EU. So the pound and the and the German mark, right? Uh, had to be stable to each other. That's the EIM. And uh, the UK was in a recession. Uh, but they needed to raise interest rates because of because of the EIM, right? Because the, the right, yeah, they need to rebalance to the mark, but that will cause a further recession. So that is ultimately what caused them to to peel out, you know, of EIM. The idea, the reason why the the entire global markets were so confident that the Britain would stay in the EIM was because there was one out. The Bundesbank can lower interest rates, right, to save the UK. And ultimately, it didn't because he had to prioritize some Eastern European countries. Uh. But here's the thing, right? At the point when Soros made the trade, uh, even until the point when he materialized, uh, he could not have known, uh, even at the 11th hour, whether the Bundesbank would lower interest rates. He is connected. He is not that well connected. Uh, right? So it will still always remain a risk, uh, uncertainty. To the, day, to, the, to the last minute or the last second when the trade actually turned out to be correct, he did not know with certainty uh, that whether or not his trade would turn out correctly or not. Right? Which means he risked being wrong. And here's the thing, he leveraged his firm to the hilt. He doubled his firm's AUM with leverage. And he bet the whole thing on a short pound shot. It was 10 billion pounds if I'm not wrong. So, um, where is the asymmetry with reward in this? You don't know, you know, and you still do it. You leverage. Well, if you double the leverage, obviously it's not risk prudent really, right? Here's the asymmetry uh, reward. Because markets were so confident that Britain was staying in the EIM, the price being offered for a pound shot uh, uh, was such uh, that the asymmetric risk reward was 1 to 25. <laughs> Which means his maximum loss was 4%. And his maximum gain was 100% if he was right. His maximum loss was 4% if he was wrong. Maximum gain was 100% if he was right. So he leveraged double. Which means his maximum loss was 8%. still only 8%. His maximum gain was 200%. And we all know what happened, uh, right? He made a billion pounds, right? On that yes, on, in one day. <laughs> yeah. Right? So, um, despite not knowing for sure, right, what he could know for sure was how much he would lose in advance. That is the concept of estimation is what? In contrast to the status quo, which teaches that you need certainty, right? You need confidence in your analysis to know whether it's correct or not before you invest, right? You need to have some sort of certainty that it will go up, right? What Soros is trying to tell us here is that you don't actually need to know. You don't need to know the outcome. Or it is, that's why he has that, that quote, la, right? It's not how much, it's yes. not, it's not uh, whether you, you, uh, you right get it wrong. right or wrong. It's how much you make when you're right, how much you lose when you're wrong. Correct. So I will augment it a little bit to make it easier to understand. It's not about whether you are wrong that is important. It's what happens if you are right and what happens if you are wrong? Which means, right, you are not really trying to predict the future, predict the outcome. You are s simply putting your hands up, saying, I don't know, right? But what I know is that if I'm right, I will make this much. If I'm wrong, I'll make this much. And if the odds are not favorable, I don't move. Yeah. This is this is Buffett's just staying still, you know, before you hit. But if the odds turn in your significantly in your favor, then you go in. Right? And you don't need to know the outcome because even if you are wrong, it doesn't matter. You live too, so you live another day. Uh, yeah, it, it doesn't matter. Yeah, you live another day. La. Whereas if you are right, you make a lot. So this is a pure bottom up approach. Right? And uh, Monish Prabhai also has another thing. Actually, right, all the, once you understand this principle, uh, you will suddenly understand uh, this is what all the legendary value investors are talking all about all along. So this is George Soros saying, right? Monish Prabhai saying is. It's a retail, I don't lose. Yes. Much. Isn't that what I was describing about in nature, CNI? It may not be the super attractive certain certainty kind of uh, maximum upside, but it is fitting this principle, right? Yeah. And then uh, Buffett, rule number one, never lose money. Rule number two, never never forget rule number one. And people might, if you stop there, which he did, people will be questioning what you mean. Uh. I will add a rule number three, uh, try and make as much money as possible. But rule number one is you don't lose money. Yeah. So within the constraints, right? And then Aroy Dimson, Risk is small things can happen, uh, then will happen. And then uh, Howard Marks. Um, you get my point, right? Yeah, I, yeah. I my point yeah. is that they're all talking about the same thing. They all come from the same thing. Once so. you realize this, right, it's like someone handed you a secret to success. Uh, 
you will be rich as I'm telling you uh, you will be rich and how many people can tell you that normally it's the other way around right? yeah <laughs> right, right. 15% right, Kager uh, is guaranteed uh, there. yeah hey you know what uh, definitely want to chat more perhaps for part 3 yeah and uh, <laughs> yeah I uh, you know guys uh, before we sign off you know please uh, you know follow Aaron on his sub stack uh, you're taking a break now but you will make a comeback soon enough so stay tuned guys and uh, thanks for coming to the pod hope you enjoyed it Right, and uh, guys, we'll see you uh, in the next pod. Signing off.